From bureaus worldwide, this is FSN. Thank you very much, Ollie Barrett. Welcome to the Richie Allen Show. It's live this Monday at 7pm as I record this live. Good to be with you. Hope you had a good weekend. Very warm, very muggy evening here in South Manchester. It is July 9th, 2018. Live right now on Fab Radio 2, Tune In Radio, TriggerWarning.tv and RichieAllen.co.uk. Thanks for joining me. Asking the questions mainstream journalists will never ask. This is your Richie Allen Show on RichieAllen.co.uk. Fab Radio 2 in Manchester and TriggerWarning.tv And has been a very busy old day. Tweet the programme right now with your thoughts. It's at Richie Allen Show on Twitter. It's the Richie Allen Show. Broadcasting live on RichieAllen.co.uk and multiple platforms around the world. And now, here's your host... Richie Allen. Going to be talking about the resignation of the Brexit Secretary David Davis, followed by the resignation of the Foreign Secretary Boris Johnson. Both men saying that they couldn't support the white paper to be published on Thursday by Theresa May, which apparently is the softest of soft Brexits, or a recommendation for the softest of soft Brexits. Now, the broadcaster and journalist... David Vance joins the programme. David is the editor of BiasTheBBC.org. He's been on the programme before. I think he's quite pleased with the developments today. We'll talk about those and the wider implications of what has happened. David Vance, at this hour on Your Richie Allen Show. And as I said, it's at Richie Allen Show on Twitter to tell me what you're thinking about this and any other subject because I promise you I will take a different course or I'll turn the corner in the second hour of the programme and we'll get away from Brexit so we will, yeah, muggy old day, not as bad as it was the week before last in terms of broadcasting from this beautiful and wonderful studio in terms of the technological equipment here but very stuffy place to be it isn't so bad today your weekend was good was it? mine was good, was in Liverpool on Saturday for the Fesh the Irish Music Festival put on by Vince Power of the Mean Fiddler Group. Saw some terrific Irish artists there. Met a lot of people there as well who uh, weren't remotely interested in the news or in the football or in any of that old malarkey. They were just there to have a beer and listen to some good, some great and some not good music. But that's the way of the festival. Is it not? It is indeed. Right, Sky News. Two stories today, of course, Amesbury and Salisbury in Wiltshire and the death of the woman who was allegedly poisoned by Novichok there. We will get into that a little bit in the programme later on. It's a big story as well, but the main story of the day is the story of the resignations I mentioned a little, uh, well, a short time ago, a couple of minutes ago. Let's hear the drama the drama from Sky News and Adam Bolton. This is Sky News live from Westminster as Boris Johnson resigns, calling into question the very future of Theresa May as Prime Minister. The now former Foreign Secretary stood down after three days of speculation over his support for the Prime Minister's Brexit plans. Proposals she's just been defending in the Commons. I've listened to every possible idea and every possible version of Brexit. Mr Speaker, this is the right Brexit. And the team the Prime Minister appointed to secure this deal for our country have jumped the sinking ship. Far from strong and stable, there are ministers overboard and the ship is listing, all at the worst possible time. Mr Johnson's resignation came less than 24 hours after the Brexit Secretary, David Davis. The Leave supporter, Dominic Raab, takes over from David Davis. Boris Johnson's successor has yet to be announced. Well, we're live at the Foreign Secretary's official residence, waiting for any sign of the departing Mr Johnson. But the big question this afternoon is, can the Prime Minister survive the disintegration at the top of her cabinet? Yes, Adam Bolton there. David Davis went overnight. Boris Johnson around about 3pm today. 
Davis, as in David Davis, saying that the proposals in the white paper amount to not leaving the European Union. Here is the outgoing Brexit Secretary, David Davis, speaking to the BBC political editor, Laura Koonsberg, where he gives a he puts more meat on the bones as to why he decided to leave. The policies are that we are now proposing to use the same rule book uh, or the same laws really as the European Union. Uh, not, not equivalent, not similar, but the same. I'm worried that what the European Union will do is simply take what we've offered and ask for more or wait for more. If we carry on with this plan and leave on those terms, is that really leaving at all? I don't think so. Um, but, you know, as I said in my letter, I hope she's right and I'm wrong. We'll see. It'll be, it'll be down to the fine detail. That's the thing. But many of our viewers might think, look, the Tory party's been arguing amongst themselves about this for two years. And hang on, the man who was meant to be in charge of this policy has now just, just walked away. I mean, doesn't it look self-indulgent? Isn't it your duty to stay no. and try to make no, those compromises so. and try to make so. this work? I have work? been making compromises for two years. <laughs> that's the point. And that's, which is fine. That's as it should be. But there comes a point when the compromise is too far. And that's the point we're at now. And how? For me. For me. For him. That's the point we're at right now. Now, I don't have any audio to bring you from the outgoing Foreign Secretary Boris Johnson, but in the last 10 minutes, his resignation letter has surfaced. Apparently, when he indicated to the Prime Minister's advisors, when he told Number 10 that he intended to resign, they announced it before he had a chance to write his letter. Anyway, he's written his letter. And the BBC has described that letter as a scathing attack on Theresa May's Brexit strategy. In the letter, Johnson says, The Brexit dream is dying suffocated by needless self-doubt. And in it, he claimed that May was leading the UK into a semi-Brexit with the status of a colony. That's being reported by the BBC in the last few minutes. The political editor, Laura Koonsberg, whom we heard from a minute ago, said Johnson's exit had turned an embarrassing situation for May into a potential full-blown crisis there. He doesn't put any punches, telling May Brexit should be about opportunity and hope and a chance to do things differently, but that dream is dying suffocated by, as I said a second ago, needless self-doubt. Doubt even. Johnson claims crucial decisions have been postponed, including preparations for a no-deal scenario. Now, we're going to get into this in a few minutes with David Vance, who, like myself, um, is a staunch supporter of the UK leaving, properly leaving the European Union. We'll talk to David shortly. Now, one of Sky News Brussels correspondents broke the news of Boris Johnson's resignation at a press conference being held by Donald Tusk and Jean-Claude Juncker. They were hosting Ukrainian President Petro Poroshe Petra Poroshenko, who's a, a US puppet, but you know that anyway. You'll hear from Tusk and Junker here as they are asked the question by the Sky News correspondent. Their answers are interesting, if not unsurprising. Gentlemen, can I just ask one more question? Boris Johnson has just announced he's resigned. I wondered if I could get your view on that, sir. Um, forgive me, um, President Poroshenko, I realise this is somewhat of a domestic issue, but the British Foreign Secretary resigned. This clearly proves that a check as to was unity in the cabinet. Yeah. I'm very sorry. This concludes the I can just repeat what I what I say about David Davis just one minute ago. But this surely is a a bit of a blow. The British Foreign Secretary resigning, the Brexit Secretary resigning. What does this mean for I for Europe? That, uh, this clearly proves that a check as there was a big unanimity, un, unity of views in the British cabinet. Uh, I, I was struck that the second time uh, Jean-Claude Juncker repeated that it, it proves there is unity from the Chequers meeting, he sounded almost uh, angry. He's um, uh, using his own sense of humour there to make the point, I guess, that uh, as one uh, or two or perhaps more uh, Brexiteers resign, then um, by default uh, the unity for, of, of that Chequers meeting uh, will come. Mm. Of course, they were meeting with Petro. Poroshenko, not Petra. <laughs> He'd have a slightly higher pitch to his voice if he was Petra, but then maybe he wouldn't. Yes, that was um, Tusk and Juncker there. Now, Tusk later tweeted, Donald Tusk, that is the European Council, uh, prays. Uh, Politicians come and go, but the problems they have created for people remain. I can only regret that the idea of Brexit has not left with Davis and Johnson 
But who knows, he tweeted. Twas the day for rolling out the spin doctors today. Alistair Campbell, mass murderer, gangster, Blair's propagandist in chief, spoke with Sky News. Adam Bolton, and throughout the interview, you're just going to hear a short section of it. He could barely contain his glee. Is, is if people actually just spell out what is actually happening? Why this is such a bad deal? Why we should actually be revisiting some of the issues of the referendum, the questions of illegality and so forth. And what we've had since the referendum is basically both of the main parties saying this has to happen. The people voted, the people spoke, it has to happen. But surely in a democracy, the will of the people can change. And I think the will of the people is changing, partly because they see the utter chaos, the costs that we were told weren't going to happen, but we're going to have to pay, the chaos of the negotiations. And I think what Theresa May has come up against, and this is what happened on Friday, when she was forced to confront the reality of Brexit, there is actually no way of doing this without doing fundamental damage to the country. I wish our politicians would be honest with us about that. Hope there's a special place in hell reserved for Alistair Campbell. Let's have another referendum. The people have changed their mind, have they? So what about Jacob Priest mog terminological inexactitude, darling? What about him? Well, he was on BBC Radio 2 today, the Jeremy Vine Show, but the Jeremy Vine Show was hosted today by Labour MP Ed Miliband, as he did last year. He's sitting in for Jeremy Vine. More on that in a minute on Miliband. So here's Rhys Mogg being interviewed in inverted commas by Miliband. Mogg says, The problem is easy to see. The cabinet is basically in favour of remaining in the EU. Um, so what, what happened was the seven people who supported Leave carried on backing a proper Brexit. And the Prime Minister has a Remainer cabinet that she appointed, voted Remain herself, and has come up with a Remain solution when she said she would do the opposite. And I think she needs to go back to what she said before. Now, now, if she doesn't change her plan, and you've said you really think that she must change her plan, are we likely to see the 40-something names that need to sign a letter to the 1922 committee, the, 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 the powerful committee of MPs, uh, and to call a vote of no confidence in the Prime Minister? And would you support that? I, I don't know. I haven't written a letter, as I say. I think it's about the policy, not the individual. I think perhaps... Might the, you be drafting one? Uh, no, I'm not drafting one. I, I think the interesting question, really, is that the fate of her proposals are now more in your hands than in mine, that I don't think she will get enough Conservatives to support these proposals at the meaningful vote stage or at the legislative stage to get it through Parliament without the support of pro-European Labour members. And therefore, your decision is going to be more important than mine. Will you want to help Theresa May get her policy through? I I'm wearing a different hat this week. I know you are, but you're still... <laughs> you, uh, uh, you're still who you are, former leader of the Labour Party, very distinguished parliamentarian, and people will listen to you and take a lead from you within the Labour Party. And it's very interesting. This is very unusual political territory. It's fascinating that the Chief of Staff is briefing Labour MPs later on today about the proposals because I simply don't think there will be the Conservative and DUP votes uh, to get through checkers. Yeah. <laughs> Did you hear that? I'll play it back for you just in case you missed it in amongst all of that waffle there. And I don't mean by Mog. Therefore, your decision is going to be more important than mine. Will you want to help Theresa May get her policy through? I I'm wearing a different hat this week. I know you are, but you're still... <laughs> Unbelievable. I can't answer you about what we can do as the Labour Party to support Theresa May. I have to pretend to be unbiased and objective because that's BBC policy, don't you know? It isn't, of course. It isn't BBC policy, of course, in reality. That is, um, well, it's unbelievable. What kind of mockery is this? Ed Miliband, hosting a BBC radio show. A topical current affairs early afternoon radio show. Ed Miliband. Ed Miliband. Why? Why is Ed Miliband sitting in for Jeremy Vine? He is. Do you want to hear a bit of it? 
It's Ed Miliband sitting in for Jeremy Vine on the programme this lunchtime. The Brexit Secretary, David Davis, resigns, saying we're giving away too much and too easily in our negotiations to leave the European Union. Are you someone who's been caught up in Southgate mania? We discuss our waistcoat-wearing hero who has got England just two games away from World Cup glory. Efforts continue to rescue seven boys and their football coach from a flooded cave in Thailand after five have been rescued. And today, you may not know this, it's International Town Criers Day. We're joined by one in the studio. Oh, yay. Oh, yay. Oh, yay. You can call me on 08000 288 291. Calls are free for most landlines. Some networks and mobile operators may charge for I these calls. I bet you you're anyway. absolutely devastated that you missed it, aren't you? Right? Ed Miliband there sitting in for... <laughs> for Jeremy Vine. What's happening to our broadcast media? I've touched on this and I'm astounded, absolutely astounded that no other journalist in this country is asking questions about what's happening to the broadcast media. You have Ian Dale on LBC Radio, complete arsehole, couldn't get elected to save his life. Tory, former chief of staff for David Davis. James O'Brien, London School of Economics. Not a journalist. George Galloway, can't get elected. Give him a radio show. Ed Miliband, London School of Economics. Harvard Business School. Unashamed. I'm not going to get into it. I could be here all night long. Alistair Campbell, criminal, murderer, LBC radio show. Jacob Rees-Mogg, Nigel Farage, I could be here all night day long talking about it. What's going on? What's going on? I'll tell you what's going on. The establishment is doubling down on its efforts to embed the media and to embed journalists. That doesn't make sense, does it? Didn't explain that very well. Five, six corporations own 97 to 98% of the media anyway. It's doubling down Remove any possibility that independent thinkers not connected to the establishment might host radio programmes nationally and might challenge the status quo. No, we'll bring you even closer to the status quo. We'll start putting these goons on radio programmes and we'll dress it up as, well, it's a lovely thing to do. Can anybody else see what's wrong with it? How have we not seen... Prominent broadsheet journalists, writers, thinkers writing about this, this trend towards putting politicians on the radio. It's incredible, isn't it? To hear Miliband interviewing Jacob Rees Mogg and <laughs> I can't answer because I'm wearing a different hat this week. Wonderful. What a world we live in. This is your Richie Allen show, twenty one minutes past the hour. Gonna take some music. So I've got I've got a bit of a problem with my Playout system. I should be taking a break, but it won't schedule the break for me. I don't know why that is, but that's okay. You don't mind that, do you? We'll take some music. When we come back, I'll be joined by David Vance, who's been on this program before, and he'll have a lot to say about what you just heard in the last 15 minutes or so. So we'll take some ELO and some Jeff Lynn. We'll go back to the 1970s, is what we'll do. Yeah, he's on tour again later this year. Jeff Lindsay, hello. Coming to Manchester in October. Can't wait for that. Welcome back to the programme. Good to be with you. A lot of tweets uh, already. 24 minutes past the hour for Monday's programme, the 9th of July. Let's get rid of Jeff there momentarily. I want to say a quick hi to Kat and Jimmy listening in sunny Glasgow. Good stuff, Kat and Jimmy. Hope you're in fine federal. Thanks for tuning into the programme. It's good to be back live this week. And not pre-recording, although it will be a fractured week, I'll talk, fragmented, I'll talk more about that later on. Let's welcome back to the programme, he's been on before, he'll be no stranger to you, the editor of BiasedBBC.org, you've got to read that website, check it out, terrific analysis on there about the bias of the BBC Corporation. He's a geopolitical commentator uh, and broadcaster, he's heard a lot on radio programmes in this country and elsewhere, like myself... He is a staunch supporter of the UK leaving the European Union properly. Let's welcome back to the show, David Vance. David, welcome back. Hi there, Richie. Good evening, and it's very nice to be back with you. Well, thanks for coming back. Right, give us your analysis of what's happened then. I got up early this morning, as I normally do very early, saw the Davis news, wasn't so surprised 
to uh, hear that, but thought it might take a few more days. Later on this afternoon, the Foreign Secretary has decided to walk. What's going on as you see it, David? Well, I think, Richie, what we're seeing is a slow motion um, collapse of the May administration. Um, You know, to lose one uh, Secretary of State is unfortunate. To lose two, well, I think that in in any other circumstances, it would actually probably bring down the Prime Minister. But we don't live in normal times, Richie. And so, obviously, she will try to front it out. But I think, think, you know, as regards David Davis uh, and his resignation, that, that may have been predicted. Boris had to go. He, he had no alternative. Had he stayed, he would forever have been damned as the guy who um, presided over the semi-Brexit, which he's put in his resignation letter. So so I think, you know, I think this in some regards, it's, it's, it's slow motion. I, I would love it to be so much faster. I would like to see Theresa May, from a political point of view, stabbed in the back, dispatched, gone. But these things tend to go rather more slowly. So we've seen the 1922 committee, I believe, meeting as we're talking, Richie. And uh, from what the uh, the soundings are there, she's been told that she's got a choice. Either she abandons her Brexit, or her checkers uh, agreement and she stays PM or she keeps it. And there's a leadership challenge. So let's wait and see. Let's wait and see what happens. I see a couple of problems here with 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 what is happening and I, I talk a lot about Brexit much to the annoyance of some of the listeners to this program one right. of the things I see happening is and everything you've said there absolutely spot on no doubt about that but what what the European Union is doing it seems to me is saying well lovely we couldn't care less what we're going to do is let the clock run down because they seem to have engineered a situation David where through the mass media and nobody knows more about the media in this country than yourself They've managed to plant an idea in the minds of UK citizens that leaving with no deal whatsoever is an absolute disaster. And the European Union are seemingly smug and satisfied knowing that. Let all this go on. Let May collapse. Let the government fold. Let there be, uh, you, you know, a general election or whatever. We're happy enough because we believe, the European Union that is, that we've, we've, we've properly engineered this situation where there cannot be a no deal scenario because if there is Parliament will get involved Parliament is largely soft Brexit if you want to look at it and break it down demographically and that's what to me the European Union can't lose no matter what happens what do you think? Well, I have to say, Richie, a lot of your analysis I have to to to, to um, endorse. I think the uh, the EU has managed to present its single biggest weakness as an incredible strength. It's and you know, truth be told, had we an honest media, which we don't, they'd never have been able to plant the notion in the minds of the British people that uh, you know a no deal Brexit is the worst possible Brexit. When in actual fact, a no deal Brexit would be the absolute, optimally uh, ideal Brexit. So, so, so truth's been stood on it on its head. But hey, listen, the EU are masters at uh, turning truth on its head. So, uh, and when you combine the fact that they're naturally treacherous, and you combine that with the mainstream media, who basically, big chunks of it, Richie, in the UK, have been echo chambers for the EU propaganda. So, so you have this remarkable convergence between EU propaganda, British media parroting what they say and that's been and then as you say a largely soft uh, remain um parliamentary um, situation you combine that and that's that's in a way where we are but but i mean david davis has made reference to preparation for a no deal and uh it'll be interesting to see what boris johnson says about that but Absolutely. I mean, my view, and, and indeed Jacob Rees-Mogg, who's another another element within all of this, and his um, his group, um, you know, they, they do talk about the prospect of a no deal. Um, so I, ultimately, this may well come down to the people versus the politicians. It probably will. But uh, from my point of view, I absolutely all along have said the best thing is that the UK could do is turn around and say, no deal, we'll offer you zero tariffs if you reciprocate 
we'll keep our 39 billion. And if we'd done that, Richie, if we hadn't done that. From the get-go. They would, they would have, yeah, from the get-go, we would have got the best deal ever. Do it's me a favour, a- David. Do me a favour. You're a businessman. I have to be, I have to try to be somehow objective because there are a lot of people listening to this programme who are terrified because they, you know, they, they get their information largely from other sources and they don't know what the hell is going on. Help me yeah. explain to people why, in a few simple matter-of-fact statements, why is leaving with absolutely no deal, sorry guys, you've, you've negotiated in bad faith, we're going to leave, we're not going to sign any agreements, we're going to leave. Help me explain to those that are genuinely worried about it how it would work, how we would be okay. Well, if in the event of there not being a deal between us and the EU, chaos does not does not prevail. We have the WTO terms of trade between between different nations. Uh, the EU are signatories to the WTO terms, just like the United Kingdom will be the day after it leaves the uh, the, the the EU. So, so what would happen then, Richie? Would be essentially there would be order. That the, the the probably the scary bit. I mean, okay, I am a businessman, so I know this, this, there is a scary bit to it, and the scary bit's not been talked up properly or, or it's not been understood. So for let me give you an example. Um, food imports from the uh, U, from the EU into the UK would be hit by a 9.8% tariff. That's what the, the approximate tariff structure would be. So um, the, that, that's what would happen to, for example, food tariffs. However, it would work the other way. And that means the products that the EU import from the UK would be hit by a 9.8% tariff. The impact would be, obviously, from I mean, just think about the average household having to find an additional 10% on its grocery shop a week. Yeah. That's inconceivable. That couldn't happen. The EU couldn't allow it to happen, and the UK wouldn't allow it to happen. And that's why, in, in many regards, you know, there, there is the uh, the elephant in the room, which is what happens if WTO tariffs have to be applied. That's the worst thing that would happen. In other products, in other areas, Richie, it could be four or five percent in terms of uh, uh, of WTO tariffs. But that hurts the EU more than it hurts the UK. Because they're so running a, a trade deficit with us, basically, which yeah. we talked about before, yeah. Yes, that's right, yeah. So they have so much more to lose. And that's why, for example, I find one of the most bizarre, I think we mentioned this before, Richie, one of the most bizarre elements is, for example, the behaviour of the Irish government, which acts as, as, as poodles, of course, for Brussels. But for the Irish government to be telling the UK, for example, what it needs to do economically in terms of uh, yeah. uh, doing a deal is ludicrous because the Irish economy would be um, you know, reduced to ash within about two weeks of a non-agreement between the EU and the UK. So in all of this, as I said, it's really interesting. The EU have successfully turned their huge weakness. Basically, they need our cash. They need our money. Their, the EU budget has, will have a massive hole in it the day after Brexit. And instead of that, what has Theresa May, May done? She's offered them $39 billion. That's enough to keep them going for about four or five years without any drastic changes. Had she not offered that, Richie, they would be sweating it because they know in eight months' time, all of a sudden, they've got a, a, an annual uh, a net 10 billion in their budget. And where's that coming from? So, you know, so in all of us here, and this is the other thing that I think, Richie, it's worth you know, trying to taking a moment to talk about. In all of this, um, the, the 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 political remainers have successfully engineered the dialogue over the past two years to create a mess. They, they, they've insisted that we mustn't get tough. We mustn't give the EU ultimatums. We mustn't tell them that essentially we're quite happy to walk away. And look where we are now, eight months ahead of Brexit. As you said at the intro of this, and you're dead right, the EU can just sit back and watch us swivel. And that's kind of what's going on at the moment. But that's why we need change, not least in number 10, Downing Street. Do you believe that David Davis and Boris Johnson and Jacob rees Mogg and others are 100% genuine in their commitment to leaving 
meaning leaving and exiting all of these uh, agreements, the single market and all the rest of it and becoming completely independent. Are they sincere, these guys? It's really, I'm getting a really good question. I think and I think David Davis is probably pretty sincere in aspects like leaving the customs union in the single market. I think he's pretty weak when it comes to control over borders. I think Boris Johnson is pretty much committed to Boris Johnson. And I think Jacob Rees-Mogg, again, is pretty genuine on the on the substance of the the the, the, the removal of, of the UK from the EU. So they're not all the same. I don't think you can sort of say that they're all exactly in the same space. And that's part of the problem, of course. There's not a clear, uh, coherent pro-Brexit position shared within government. That's part of the problem, Richie. It's, I mean, it is a bit of a mess. But I, do, do I think Jason, Jacob Rees-Mogg wants the UK out of the um, EU institutions? Yeah, I do. Do David, you? I don't know, is the answer. I don't know. It, it's interesting. It was interesting this morning to watch Mogg on a couple of different channels being fairly reluctant to criticise May in the manner it seems that Boris Johnson has in the last half an hour, his letter has finally surfaced and yeah. the language is pretty strong in it in terms of, yeah. you know, he says semi-Brexit status of a colony um, that, you know, we're, we're being suffocated by needless self-doubt. He's certainly gone a bit stronger. He's gone in a bit, a bit harder than Jacob rees -Mogg. I don't know. I've, I've been reading and writing about and talking about and listening to people talk about the European Union for years. I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely convinced and I have been for a number of years you know, since I left mainstream media, that it's just, it's just, a, it's a major stepping stone to a one world government. I, I, I believe that. I used to think it was crazy conspiracy theory. And I think there's some very powerful elites, banking elites and political elites that will do anything to prevent the UK leaving yeah. and thriving. Okay. Because, of course, if the, I mean, you mentioned the Republic of Ireland. I mean, I'm a proud yeah. Irishman, the same as you're a proud yeah. Northern Irishman. Yeah. To, to see my country, you know, great leaders of, of my country going down the centuries that stood up to imperialist um, British rule, regardless of what you think about yeah. that, yeah, yeah, would be yeah. spinning in their graves that my country is nothing but a whoremonger for the European yeah. Union. We've lost everything. The forestries, mm -hmm. everything we've lost to the European Union. You know, the, the brightest and best young Irish men and women have to get out of the country. It's nothing but a skeleton of what it used to be. You know yourself, you do business there. You know what it's yeah. like. You know, and, and, and uh, to see Simon and Coveney and that idiot Varadkar and some of the things they're saying as our country has been bled dry by that institution. I just see that institution doing everything it can to prevent any country leaving successfully. Even, I'll give you some conspiracy theory, David. You might, you might laugh at this. But when Alexis Tsipras and the Syriza movement got big in Greece, I, I get most of my predictions wrong. I'm terrible. I'm certainly no Nostradamus. But I did say that these evil institutions and the powers behind them, they often yep. provide us with the opposition to it. And it did that with Tsipras, who on the face of it was brilliant. He was going to stand up to the EU with Varoufakis and all of that. But then he yep. sold his country down the river by saying, don't, excuse me, do vote no in this referendum. Vote no to the bailout and we'll stand up to them. And then the bastard, excuse my language, he went and he signed a worse deal. I think they've got it sewn up, David. I'm a pessimist, to be honest. Yeah. Well, well, Richie, they, they do say that a pessimist is uh, an optimist mugged by reality. <laughs> that could so, be it, yeah. Yeah. Don't, Go ahead. Don't, don't, despair, don't despair in that. But, I mean, actually, again, I, I echo much of what you've said. I believe the EU is fundamentally uh, evil. I think it's it's part of a globalist agenda, so I'm aligned with you in that. And and I absolutely am sure that they will do everything. Uh, those and the the, the Soros uh, influencers uh, behind them to stop uh, a British Brexit, um, and that's that's what we've that's basically I believe what we saw back in 2016 when David Cameron fell, having failed to deliver. Uh, you know, May was uh, levered in to make sure that she would then deliver uh, a remain, and that's pretty much what we saw on Friday. So they they don't want it to happen, but sometimes in the if you look across the sweep of history and the, the sweep of politics. Things happen that aren't expected. You know, sometimes um, things are th things, despite all odds, 
uh, Richie. You know, uh, the, the result isn't what the elites want. And I don't know what you think of, for example, in Italy with um, with Five Star yeah, and La Liga. Yeah. But, I mean, that seems to be something that they're not very happy about. Uh, maybe they'll do exactly the same there as they've done in Greece. Maybe they'll, you know, they'll infiltrate. They'll, they'll they'll flip they'll flop. Do... Yeah, well, that's, yeah. That, that's my... That's my lousy prediction. My lousy prediction is that these guys... Well, I mean, they backed down straight away, didn't they? The EU said they didn't like their choice for finance minister, and they just agreed. They said, all right, then we'll, we'll get somebody else. Let me, let me, let me slightly change attack, because I don't, I don't get to chat to you that often. And, and I'm, I'm not going to drop any bombshells on you now, but you, you, yeah. and, I, you and I are concerned about uh, something. We, we've got a similar concern, and that is censorship and language and the the attempt by the establishment to police language and to you know this word hate speech that's out there i saw that there was a pride march in london over the weekend lovely no problem all good but um some um there were some lesbian women there uh very annoyed about uh transgender rights and the changing yeah. of language and all this so they decided to protest against it the, that they'd make their feelings known during the parade they were called haters and hate speech and all of that. And I think I've had a couple of academics on the programme recently who are very concerned. We had it recently, didn't we, about homophobic chanting at football. We're going we're, we're gonna to police that. We're going we're, we're to criminalise that and possibly imprison people for saying things that... I think if you and I were at a football match and there was some guy and he kept screaming out stuff, we'd probably police it ourselves. We'd probably say to the guy, listen, yeah, would, yeah. shut up, yeah. you know what I mean? Leave it alone, you know? First of all, the player can't hear you and second of all, stop being an idiot. Are you worried, David, that independent thinking, independent voices are going to be marginalised by an increasingly almost Orwellian kind of clamp down on free speech. Yeah, and it's absolutely, and it's, it, it is it is one of the biggest problems we face. We it, it's across the whole social media uh, piece, if you like. Uh, we've now got the you know the Twitter giants and the Facebook giants uh, and the YouTube giants uh, making sure that some words are not said. And, uh, you know, if you want to get banned on Twitter, then there's certain words that if you use them, um, they will take you out. And in that way, we're, and I think this is actually even more wicked than the, um, if you like, the neo-Marxists who want to impose the, um, the so-called um, um, you know, politi political correctness. Yeah. I mean, there's no such thing as political correctness. Absolutely not. It doesn't exist. But what there is is uh, neo-Marxists who want to who want to stop us saying certain things. But what's even worse than them is when you have the likes of Twitter, as at the moment, for example, certain words. If you say them because it's not uh, it's not convenient, then uh, you know you're going to be banned. So what happens, Richie, is you don't use the words. You self-censor. Yeah. And I, I think arguably that's worse. But what's your choice? You know, go ahead, say the words and suddenly lose your platforms. You're dead right. We live in a time when free speech has never been under more attack, uh, has never been under attack more. And the dangers are that we basically are t made to shut up but I think, Richie, there are quite a few of us prepared to keep talking as long as we can. I hope so. I mean, I, I, I came up in radio in in Ireland and this is this is a strange time for me because I remember inviting people on my programmes with, you know, a wide variety of views and often views that I didn't agree with. But, you know, to, yeah. to have to have in-depth conversations. I, I've heard you in the past not speaking to me, talking about... You know, it's laughable in the media. Somebody's invited on with a counterpoint and they give them three or four minutes and the audience never really gets to hear what they really mean. It's just a kind yeah. of a shouting match and whatever. But I remember a time when, no matter what somebody's point of view was, they were heard out and the audience was trusted to be smart enough to say, well, well, I, I lean towards what David Vance is saying. Richie Allen's not making a lot of sense or, or vice versa. What happened to that? Yeah. I, I invite people on this radio programme and... When they're, no, I'm neither left nor right nor whatever, no matter what anybody says. You know, mm -hmm. I, I left, I was never in politics, but I left believing that politicians could make a change. I've moved away from that a long time ago. I don't yeah. think I'm God Almighty and that I'm right, but that's what I feel. But, you know, I invite certain people on the programme now who, who might come from this Marxist kind of ideology, and a lot of them are prominent people. And they express yeah. an interest in coming on until they find out that I said something that 
they found offensive and then they don't come on. Now, I find this terrifying as a producer, David. Jesus Christ, yeah. if, if you're worried about it, come on and tell me I'm an idiot. I'm not going to scream at you. If you disagree with my point of view on Israel, for example, as I know that you would, David, you know, yeah. don't say, well, I'm not talking to you, uh, Richie, uh, because some of the stuff you said about Israel. Um, come on and, and have a go or whatever. I mean, you're a loyalist from the north. I'm a Republican from the south who's never supported violence. No more than you have. But I like yeah. you. I like you. I think you're a great guy. I'll have you on. We can have a chat about anything. But it seems that there's a movement away from that in the media. You either agree yeah. with me 100% or you're not coming on my programme. Absolutely right. But the thing is that political discourse, you know, civilised political discourse is being basically erased because, you know, either if they don't like what you've said, they'll not come on your show and talk and explain their point of view. Yeah. Maybe that's just because they can't. I mean, you know, don't don't lecture me about academic. Uh, <laughs> some of these, uh, yeah. you know, academics come on. Um, they're, they're, they're some of the most stupid people I've ever met. Um, but they, they, they don't want to have their views challenged. And just as importantly, they want to have your views suppressed. And, and, and I think that's where the dichotomy is. I mean, again, I'm old enough to remember, Richie, maybe say back in the in the, in the, in the sort of late 70s or whatever, um, it was if you like the political right, they were the people under censorship, in, into censorship and maybe limiting what people could talk about and say. And the left were at that point much more open towards free conversation, if you like, let's call it that. But, but after, you know, after, after 30, 30, 40, 35 years, it's all flipped. And now it's the intolerant left who don't want to have conversations. They just want to shout you down and, um, and shut you up. And that, unfortunately, is what permeates so much of broadcasting then, um, Richie, in, in the UK. One reason, for example, you know, I would sooner go to North Korea than go to the BBC programme. Um, probably get a better hearing in North Korea, actually. Uh, although, mind you, given Trump's success out there, that might be such a bad destination. Um, but, uh, yeah, so I think the, um, the the onslaught on free speech is being driven by this kind of, uh, by the new fascists who are essentially those who masquerade as anti-fascists. And there you go. 1984 is every day in 2018. Do you know what's incredible? You said everything you just said there was echoed by... Stuart Wayton, who's a PhD at Abertay University in Dundee, I'm sure you've come across his work, Stuart. I saw him on Sky News where he was laughing at the idea that you'd uh, try and arrest people for homophobic chanting. And he completely, he wasted the presenter who was very, uh, you know, very much of the politically correct um, kind of point of view. And Stuart yeah. said, look, every single survey that was ever done on football fans shows that they don't have any antipathy towards gay men and women. Football fans scream and shout things that they think will wind somebody up. It doesn't matter yeah. what it is. It doesn't necessarily, you know, mean they mean it. So I brought him on the programme. He was absolutely amazing. And everything you said, he basically endorsed. It used to be the left that would debate yeah. and argue with anybody. And now yeah. I find you are 100% right. It is the opposite. If I ring up somebody from the States and they, you know, are on the old right or they might be very conservative and they'll have a look at my website and then they'll come back to me and they'll go, well, I don't agree with anything you say, Richie, but I'll tell you what, I'll come on. That's incredible. Yeah. I ring up a lefty. Uh, no, 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 um, you hate the Jews. I don't hate the Jews. I don't hate anybody. I don't like the Israeli government. That's what it is. But why don't you come on and tell me that I'm wrong to be um, anti-Israel? Why don't you do that? Let's make a good radio show out of it. We can have an hour. We can bang it out there. No, no, no. As you said, David, you have to be shut down. So here's the question, my friend. I don't want to eat into too much of your time. I know you have things to do. What are we going to do yeah. about that? Because they, 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 they have prominence now, these people, these cultural Marxists who are shutting down mm. people and getting people fired from jobs because of their opinions or whatever. What are we going to do about it? Yeah, so again, great question. And, and I wish there was an easy answer. I mean, the, the, the only obvious antidote I can see to it um, is in the White House, where if there ever was one guy who is against the globalist agenda, broadly speaking, and who's not politically correct, and he isn't afraid to say what he thinks, it's Donald Trump. Um, I, I look around the political landscape and all I see are uh, weak need quizzlings, uh, people who are prepared to censor what they say. Um, and I just don't know what the answer is, Richie. I just think that all you can do, all any of us can do is speak plainly and clearly and hope that 
a wind will come and where it blows from, who can tell? And that will help then, you know, blow away all this uh, this wicked censorship, which is strangling the body politic, which is sprang- strangling debate, which is, which is, and, and, it's, and the other thing about it is, I also think, Richie, I don't know if you'd agree, but one of the healthy things, which I know you try to do is by having different views on, people get to spout their own thing, whatever that is, Absolutely. And, and, and that's so healthy. But if you shut down a significant sector of society and basically tell them you can't, you know, we're not in, just, just be quiet, you're, you're going to start to build a powder keg and sometimes powder kegs explode. And again, look across the sweep of history. You know, I don't think you can indefinitely suppress truth. That's another belief I have. I'm truth, a bit like a, a weed getting its way up through concrete, Richie. It does It does yeah. eventually make its way back up again. So despite their censorship, despite the lack of uh, their lack of desire to engage or debate, um, ultimately, I don't think they will succeed. And, uh, you know, come back to me in five years' time. Maybe I'll be in a gulag. But on the basis, I'm still a free man back then, Richie. I could be sitting in a gulag with you, and it, I'll be saying, we'll be, be with me, actually. So. Yeah, we'll be, we'll be saying to one another, um, yeah, li- li- yeah. li- loyalists and Republicans brought together by censorship in, <laughs> in the UK media. So, so just before you go deep into yeah. injury time, um, Will we ever leave then? What do you think? Yes or no? Yeah. Yeah, I think we I think we will. I think we're going to have to make a... Anyone who thought that June 23rd, 2016 was the result, you know, that was enough, is living in cuckoo land. But I think you're going to see lots of changes in the body politic in the UK in the next week. Um, I think, for example, there's, I understand tonight Nigel Farage is making making a speech about potentially a comeback. So things are um, things are changing, Richie, and uh, you know the direction is they're so desperate to force us into a kind of sustained relationship with the UK, with the EU, but somehow, just somehow, there's seventeen point point four million reasons why that mightn't happen. Good so stuff. I guess. Mathematically, I'd stick with the 17.4 million reasons why we should and hopefully will get out. Brilliant stuff. Folks, if you want to get points of view that you don't hear on this programme, and that's a good thing, go to altnewsmedia.net, altnewsmedia.net. Read all about the BBC, poisonous organisation that it is, at uh, biasedbc.org. David, thanks for coming back on. I appreciate it, mate. I look forward to doing it again. Talk. Pleasure to talk. Cheers. Take care. Cheers, Bye-bye. buddy. Bye for now. David Vance, live on the line from his home on Monday's Richie Allen Show. I have no idea what time it is. What time is it? I've got to do a time check. Yeah, it's seven minutes to the top of the air, the 9th of July, 2018. Let's try and take an ad break. <laughs> Let's try and do that. Do you know what's happened to me? Software updates. No matter how much I get into the settings of the suite of computers here, because it is a suite of broadcast um, computers specifically designed for broadcasting and I get into the suite of software and say don't ever update again and it does anyway no idea why that is let's uh, take a quick break have you lost access to important data from a computer hard drive, mobile phone, or other storage device? Maybe you have a broken hard drive containing years of information, or a smartphone that no longer works from which you'd like the pictures, movies, and chats recovered. If you would like to recover data from any type of digital device, including desktop and laptop computers, external hard drives, cameras, smartphones, NAS, and RAID servers, then contact Data Clinic today at dataclinic.co.uk now. Introducing the H2O app, a powerful water structure and application that programs vibrational energies into water through the use of different sound frequencies. Once programmed, the use of water for drinking, cooking, bathing. Give it to your friends and colleagues or spread it around the garden. The list goes on. It's not just water that the app can be used for either. It's great for programming crystals too. The H2O app is free to download and is available on both Android and Apple platforms. For further information, go to h2oapp.online. Right, welcome back to the programme. Is that right? Is it? Yeah, that's it. Right, welcome back. <laughs> it worked anyway. It worked. Six minutes, is it, to the top of the hour? A lot of tweets on that. Let's have a read of them. I'm well aware, by the way, and I'm not immune to listeners 
not so much complaints but observations and I know that there are people who listen to the programme they're fed up of it Brexit but it's so important it's so important why is it Richie why is it important you might ask you're the big big baldy Irish guy there shouting your mouth off you say that it's not going to happen so why is it so important it's important because when it doesn't happen I know David Vance there said that he thinks it will when it in my opinion when it doesn't happen inevitably Maybe it's a way to kick people in the arse and to realise that politicians are two sides of the same coin all over the world. It doesn't matter where they are, what country, you know, the vast majority of politicians. I'm not saying that within various parliaments there are not one or two people who manage to get elected who are decent and who want to do things to enrich the lives of their constituents and their fellow citizens. I'm not saying that. But parties largely are working for the establishment, for the elite, for the financial elites who couldn't give a shite which party is in. And never is that more obvious than now when you have Parliament and you have the Conservative Party led by a cabinet headed by a prime minister running a cabinet of people who want to subvert the will of the people look across the aisle and you have a load of Blairites who want to suppress the will of the people stated by 17.4 million people 52 percent doesn't matter isn't it incredible when they say that um when politicians say that you know, we can't have a hard Brexit and you can't get what you want and the 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 Brexiteers have to take into consideration the opinions of Parliament. Well, fuck Parliament. Parliament is supposed to effect or carry out the wishes of the people, isn't it? I think I read somewhere, uh, I read that somewhere once before. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure when I voted in my last election, which was, Jesus, Ireland... 2002 was it might have been Ireland 2002 you know I think I didn't vote for my country to give the forestries the forests of the country to give the country's energy little as it is to give the country's ports and airports to globalist corporations on the orders of the European Union to pay back a debt that I never incurred I'm pretty sure of that I'm pretty sure when people went to the polls in this country last year and the previous election to that and so on, so on, so on, I'm pretty sure they didn't vote for us to give weapons to a tyrannical, totally batshit, fucking crazy regime like Saudi Arabia to kill hundreds of thousands of Yemenis with. I'm pretty sure that people didn't vote for that. In fact, I'm certain of it. When will people wake up to it? It doesn't matter. Oh, Jeremy... Jeremy, he's going he's gonna to nationalise everything. No, he's not. He's a liar. He is a bearded, tweed-wearing, elbow-patch fucking liar. He's not going to nationalise anything. He's not. He's not going to take on globalism. This is a guy who, for years, sat on the back benches and talked about the tyranny of the European Union. Now he's got a whiff of power... Well, we have to have close possible relationship as we can with the European Union. We've got to have a trading deal with the European Union. I refuse to say that freedom of movement will end. Well, you see, again, I think that when people went to the polls in June 2016, they voted for the end of freedom of movement and not because they are racist bastards, not because they don't like their brown-skinned brethren and sistren. No, they were fed up of wages being driven down by a migrant workforce prepared to come in and work longer hours and for less money and be prepared to live 12 or 13 people to a three-bedroom house. What chance do you have of competing against that? That's what people voted against. Not racism, or can't stand the Indians, or the Sikhs, or the Pakistanis, or whoever the hell. <clears throat> there is no democracy, folks. This is a tyranny. It's a fascist state we live in. It's an absolute tyranny. And I was thinking today, this is a stream of consciousness, forgive this. I'll, I'll get off it in a minute. I was thinking today, I'll have to leave this country pretty soon. It's a great thing. I, I, I can do this from anywhere. It's set up. 
and it's so wonderful today with the technology is that I can take it anywhere. You know, it's up to, or indoors, as it were, who's a very gifted um, polyglot, speaks several languages, uh, got loads of qualifications. She can do anything. And she's open to moving. She likes her current job. I don't think she wants to move, you know, in, 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 the, in, in the short term because she's enjoying the job she's in. But if it came to it, there isn't a country in the world she couldn't go to and work in because of her abilities. And I'm looking at this situation. I've recently received another phone call from my deep throat at the BBC, my friend who I've known for 20, 25 years, who tells me that the censorship of standalone radio and television programmes like this is coming this year or next year at the latest. Where we'll be told we can't broadcast without a licence. And that license comes with responsibilities. Under license to Ofcom, if you say this or say that, that could be construed as hate speech. Not just me, but my guests. Therefore, you'll be fined and fined and fined and and you'll have your license taken away from you. That's what's coming down the line here. What do you do about it? I was chatting to a friend of mine today about countries where we could go to do this in the future, if it became necessary no democracy no such thing as democracy doesn't exist doesn't exist you have a cabinet of multi-millionaires how could you be represented by a multi-millionaire who went to private schools who went to the London School of Economics who went to the Harvard Business School how could these people possibly represent you and what choice do you have I'm tired of saying this to people This is a proper stream of consciousness, this, isn't it? I'm tired of saying to people, when you go to the the voting booth on general election day, you're given six candidates, but you didn't get to choose them. Did you want to run? Did you want to throw your hat into the ring? I'll do it. I'll I'll put my name down. You have no chance. Because the system is rigged. Basically, financial elite saying, here you go whether you're in Oldham, Blackburn, Preston, Huddersfield, London, Southampton, here you go, here's six people, choose from one of those, I couldn't give a fuck which one you pick, because they all work for me. Rabid Zionists, criminals, lawyers, all of them, all of them. Yeah, one or two good apples over the years, in Parliament, the likes of Tony Benn, the likes of Anne Whittacombe, Great woman, Anne. I've known Anne for years. As eccentric as a box of frogs, but completely and utterly committed to doing the best for the people that she was elected to represent. But what can they do in this situation, in this system? Three minutes past the hour. Keep the tweets coming in. It's at Richie Allen Show, at Richie Allen Show on Twitter. Alistair Campbell going on television today, you know. You know, every time I see Alistair Campbell's face on television, I think of Dr. David Kelly, former weapons inspector, medical doctor, murdered. Murdered for blowing the whistle on the dodgy dossier, telling the BBC his name was leaked, of course, and he was humiliated and We were told he killed himself. Murdered. When I look at Alistair Campbell on television, same way we should have a second referendum. Murder. Tony Blair talking about why it's wrong to leave the European Union. Murder. Murder. Cartoon Drunk tweets, a bit like how Radio Caroline was shut down. Uh, Daniel tweets, in the end there will be no country to go to if you don't like it. Um, It'll be the same in any other country, I think is what Daniel is saying there. Uh, Hi to Bob Stu, hi to Ricky as well, to David Stanford, to Busy. Um, Hi to Chris, who says Trump is beholden to the Rothschilds. They uh, and his Commerce Secretary, Wilbur Ross, bailed him out when he ran into trouble with Resorts International in the 80s. You're right, Chris. And that's what I think about Trump. But because my feelings are very well known, to my listeners about Trump, I don't feel the need every time somebody supports Trump on the programme to basically jump in and uh, contradict him. 
I don't see the need to do that. But yes, you're right. Uh, you know, Trump is no different to Obama or to George W. Bush or to Clinton or to George H. W. Bush. They're all the same. They work for the same people. Trump is a rabid Zionist. Strings are pulled from Tel Aviv. That's what I believe. But I know I'm 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 quite happy to live with the opinions of others and not to be constantly ramming my opinions down their throats, particularly when, as I said, my listeners are pretty much in the loop in terms of what I really think about the um the Trump presidency as it stands. Right, I'm gonna take some music and back in a minute with more. Music from Paul Simon, you can call me Al on the Richie Allen Show. It's coming up for 10 minutes past the hour, Monday's programme. Ah, we're entering the silly season now, I think. I think there'll be a bit of a lull now after all this nonsense. Uh, We'll have a few days of recriminations after the resignations of Johnson and of Davis, but I think things will settle down as the children go on their summer holidays, which is very soon, isn't it, here in the UK? Very soon, I believe. Hi to Les Hude who says, Richie, what gets me is when people that say they trust politicians but they can't believe politicians would lie about 9-11 or the 7th of July or Brexit. I'll tell you what, Les. And Claire Henderson tweeted, or the Novichok mystery, which we'll come to in a second, Claire. Nice to know you're listening, by the way. Look, on September 11th and the 7th of July, here's where I am with politicians. If you and me have more than grave reservations about the authenticity and the veracity of the 9-11 Commission report, which we do. We know it's a crock of horse manure, don't we? It stands to reason that relatively smart, no smarter than you or me, no dumber than you or me. It stands to reason that politicians will have opinions on September the 11th. Now, I can say this. When I was in Spain and I was making these types of programmes, when I, when I first began to make programmes looking at alternative explanations of events, I would sometimes in Spain bump into Irish politicians whom were on their summer holidays. Now, I'm not talking about very senior politicians. I'm not talking about ministers or prime ministers or whatever, but um, TDs, Chuck de Dola, which is the Irish version of MPs. So basically Irish MPs, TDs. And some of them I would know from my time in radio, others I wouldn't. But the ones who I would know, they would um, express a certain incredulity that somebody like me coming from the mainstream media, commercial media, would now be entertaining some of the ideas being expressed on my show. And I would ask them, come on, September 11th, you must have. And quite a few of them would say, yeah, it's never sat easy with me that. These are TDs, MPs. And I would say, what do you mean? They would say, well, it never added up entirely. And I would say, well, what do you plan to do with that information? And the inevitable answer would be, what could I do? What could you prove? I said, you don't have to prove anything. As an elected politician, you can start to ask a few questions. In Parliament, in the Irish Dáil, in the Dáil, which is the Parliament, D-A-F-A-I-L, the Dáil. Why don't you ask a few questions? Why don't you say, listen, I've, uh, I've learned some things about September the 11th, about Building 7, about the things stored within Building 7, about the fact it was never hit by a plane about the fact that it collapsed into its own footprint at free fall speed. Maybe you could ask one or two questions in Parliament, but of course, the, you know, that that's never going to happen. Yes, there's no doubt in my mind that politicians the world over would look at September 11th and would have seen documentaries about it and would have heard independent radio shows from time to time and naturally would say, yeah, there's something very wrong there. But what can they do? Hi to Natalie. Richie, uh, loved last week's programme. Thank you, Natalie. Uh, Thankfully, working nine to five this week so I can catch the show live. Natalie says she's concerned for the future of this and dozens of other shows 
in terms of potential new rulings. Where is that underground web already, says Natalie. And it was always understood. I've been broadcasting and producing for years. It was always understood that the internet was devoid of or free from overarching regulation. It was always understood that if you broadcast your show and you weren't part of a linear schedule, this is an important thing to remember, if you weren't part of a programming schedule under an umbrella organisation, well then you could do your show, you could express your opinions and you would be unmolested by the agencies of the state. That was always a given the world over. Now, of course, when you stream on the internet and your stream can be accessed by people, you have a certain responsibility. What responsibility, I hear you ask? Well, you have a responsibility not to do anything that could cause harm to a third party. For example, not to encourage violence, not to suggest that it's okay to go around and give X, Y or Z a kicking. You also have a responsibility not to be urging people to... Now, I know you're going to disagree with this. I could be stirring some shit here. You've got a responsibility not to endorse anything that you don't know anything about. You've got a responsibility to not, for example, tell people, don't listen to your oncologist anymore. Take cannabis oil. That will cure you. Now, this might surprise some of you, and you might not, be a not, you, you might not like this, but that's a good rule, that. I shouldn't come on here and say, don't speak to your oncologist at, at the Christie Hospital in Manchester. Listen to me, take cannabis oil. That's outrageous for me to say that. What's also outrageous is for the state to tell me that I can't speak to medical practitioners who are qualified to talk about cannabis oil. So that's what you do. That's responsible broadcasting. You bring somebody on. I've had Rick Simpson on in the past, long time ago. Others who know what they're talking about and you say, right, what, what, what's the deal with cannabis oil? Let them speak. But also point out, listen, speak to your doctor as well, but why not try this, why not try that? That's a responsible thing to do. But broadcasters, independent broadcasters, do have responsibilities. Don't do or say anything that could cause somebody else to be harmed. And don't be messing with people's physical well-being by telling people what to do and endorsing things. That's wrong. That's very wrong. That'll wind some of you up now. But listen to what I'm saying. Talk about it. Give these people a platform where the mainstream media won't give them a platform. But don't tell people, yeah, yeah, you should do this, you should do that. That's outrageous. I shouldn't be telling you anything other than my opinions, good, bad or indifferent, but not telling you what to do. And those are good rules. And I think most people who, in the last 10, 15 years, who broadcast live on the internet, most people implicitly understood those rules. Don't urge or don't recommend or don't support violence or harm against anybody. Don't go naming people or giving information that might lead to the whereabouts of somebody who might be on trial for offences against children, for example. That's absolutely wrong to do that. Yeah, 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 this guy who uh, molested children, Mickey Murphy, yeah, yeah, he's living on 5 Morrison's Road. That's outrageous. You should go to prison for that. That's implicitly understood, right? Where am I going with this? Christ, you're rambling, Richie. I'm not. I'm going somewhere. And these were the things that we understood as broadcasters. But, outside of that, messing with people's physical health, giving clues to people's identity, 
urging people to do violent things. Outside of that, people should be left alone. There are laws to deal with that sort of thing. What we're seeing now is a movement away from totally independent content creators on the internet with their stream, speaking to one person, ten people or no people, or a hundred people, or a thousand people, should be left alone to do what they're doing so long as they're not breaking the law. They should not be regulated. But regulation is here now. They just haven't started knocking on doors yet. But my deep throat source, who's an expert in all things media and who has worked at the BBC for over 30 years and has worked in compliance for Ofcom, says they're coming very soon to say, right, and it might take them a while to reach people. I mean, it takes them a long time to get to people who don't pay their TV licence. But eventually they'll get to people. Obviously, the more successful people the more prominent people, if you want to use words like that, I don't want to be sounding big-headed or egotistical, but people who've got a big reach, yeah, they'll be knocked on, their doors will be knocked on first. Hi, you are broadcasting, you're now, as of today, you're in violation of code and title dash 3645 or whatever. You now need a license to go on to your own website and to speak about geopolitical events. There was a time when I thought, well, fuck it. We'll get the licence. Yeah, play their game. Get the licence and then they'll leave you well enough alone. You do a professional job anyway, Richie, I would say to myself, not bigging myself up. You're professional. You're fair. You're not causing harm. You're not recommending harm. You're not telling people not to go to the doctor. You're not doing this. Just pay the money and be damned. No, no, it doesn't work like that. Because once you're in the club, as I said earlier on, it then becomes a regular thing where they contact you to say that they have received a complaint. Because Dr. Rima Labo spoke on the programme and said this about vaccines. This is harmful. It doesn't matter that when I speak with Rima, I would point out that physicians disagree with her, that parents disagree with her, that even though I am sympathetic to her points of view and I agree with her, there are people who disagree and people should make their own minds up and look into it and do their own research. Very adult, very mature thing to say. It doesn't matter. They will say, by allowing her on the air, you're in breach and violation of X, Y, Z, Z, Z. Everybody has to be immunised. This is, this is standard procedure now. There's no debate about it. Therefore, strike one. Your fine is £200. No problem. I'm sure we could raise the £200 in 20 minutes on Patreon. Strike one, though. Strike three. You can't broadcast anymore. You're banned. Well, fuck them. No, no. Not fuck them. Then they come and they take your broadcasting equipment away from you. That's what they do. This is where it's going. I'm starting to sound like that lunatic Alex Jones now. And, and that's the last thing I want. I used to love Alex. Um, and it sounds paranoid. But that is where it is going. The only option is to get out of the country. And do it from somewhere that's got a decent internet service provider. And do it from there. And wait and see what happens. But, you know... It's not going to be next month or six months' time, but I think within a year, this programme won't be presented from this city. I'm pretty sure of it. Please, God, in July of 2019, you'll be laughing at me and saying you were wrong, Richie. But that's where it's going. That's where it's going. I was due to have a guest this hour, by the way, um, but they've asked me to postpone temporarily. I don't know why that is. I don't know if it's because of something that was said on the programme, so I won't mention who it is, but I hope they'll um, agree to come back later in the week. This is why you're listening to me and not to another guest this evening. Cliff Moore is tweeting, Cliff, lovely to hear from you again. Hope you're well. He says, Richie, I spoke to four strangers at a training event over this last weekend. All spoke of how our governments are corrupt and provided great examples. So the message is getting out to people, Richie. Keep going for as long 
as you were able to. And of course I will. I have no intentions of not doing this programme. I enjoy doing it. And, um, you know, as long as I enjoy doing it. And as long as I think that I'm not preaching to the converted all the time and that we are getting to one or two people who might be having second thoughts, I'll continue to do it. Cartoon Drunk says, Deadly nerve agent on the loose in Salisbury. But don't worry, baby wipes will neutralise it. <laughs> Hi to Moinga. Uh, Hi to Base Ninja, um, who tweets, No politician is ever going to admit that 9-11 was an inside job. Would they really give up their nice salaries, etc.? Richie, says Base Ninja. No, mate, they would not. That's 100% right, that. Of course they wouldn't. Of course they wouldn't. Let me scroll on down there. Loads more tweets came in there. I mean, Bin Laden died in hospital shortly after September 11th, didn't he? He died of kidney failure. It was reported widely. You think I'm making it up? Look up Fox News, Bin Laden dead. New York Times, Bin Laden dead. Bin Laden died. He was known as uh, Tim, wasn't he? He was a CIA um, operative, effectively. He was handled by the CIA and a great buddy of all things America when the Afghan people were fighting off the Ruskies. It's the greatest bullshit story ever told, the story of Bin Laden, the man who orchestrated 9-11 from a cave in the Tora Bora Mountains. The Super Cave! Look up Rumsfeld, Bin Laden, Super Cave on YouTube and watch that absolute bullshit new segment where, bin, where, where Rumsfeld tried to convince you that Bin Laden had some sort of uh, Blofeld type secret cave facility, all futuristic, all dug out of a cave. The lies that people were told. The lies. And they believed them. Mawinga tweets, I was hoping you would start f- flagging some energy drinks and pills. Supplements and stuff. No. And I'm not, you know, putting down supplements and stuff like that. I don't know. The thing you should always do is not make statements about stuff you know nothing about. We laugh at the overkill selling tactics by Alex and his mates and it's all a bit ridiculous. But, but I don't know what those supplements do. I've never taken any of them, so I have no idea. But I won't be selling supplements anytime soon. Merchandise, maybe. Not anything with my big ugly mug on it, but merchandise, maybe. To, um, you know, to help fund the programme going down. Going down the line. K. Philbilly tweets, That lunatic Alex Jones predicted this to be fair to him. He suggested a return to print media. What are your thoughts on that? Laughable, K. Philbilly. Laughable for Alex or anybody else to suggest the print media. Print media is dead. Dinosaur. Gone. You've got titles going out of publication, going out of print all over the world. People will not buy a newspaper from a newsstand. They won't do it. They just won't. Look at look at local newspapers all over the country. The ones that are left are now free two days a week. Three day, four, five days a week you pay for them. Two days a week they're free. And you're going to find it'll be three days a week free, four days a week free. And eventually local newspapers will be packed full of advertisements. Not so much news, thin on news. But the advertising will pay for the publication and the papers will be free. That's where we're going. Newspapers are dead. And that was by design as well. You know. Tim Blofeld Osman, the wickedest Arab in the world, got younger and younger. He did. Who can ever forget when the US news media kept playing videos of Bin Laden purportedly anti-American messages being sent out by Bin Laden. And he looked like a different man in each one of them because he was on dialysis, because he was dying as his body was shutting down in a hospital which might have even been in Germany. I don't know. 28 minutes past the hour. Very quick break. Back with more in a minute. This is Monday's Richie Allen Show. 
Have you lost access to important data from a computer hard drive, mobile phone, or other storage device? Maybe you have a broken hard drive containing years of information, or a smartphone that no longer works from which you'd like pictures, movies, and chats recovered. If you would like to recover data from any type of digital device, including desktop and laptop computers, external hard drives, cameras, smartphones, NAS, and RAID servers, then contact Data Clinic today at dataclinic.co.uk now. Introducing the H2O app, a powerful water structure and application that programs vibrational energies into water through the use of different sound frequencies. Once programmed, the use of water for drinking, cooking, bathing. Give it to your friends and colleagues or spread it around the garden. The list goes on. It's not just water that the app can be used for either. It's great for programming crystals too. The H2O app is free to download and is available on both Android and Apple platforms. For further information, go to h2oapp.online. I think we're back, aren't we? We shouldn't be back. I don't know what's going on with this thing. Introducing the H2O app, a powerful water structure and application. Ah, it's just one of those evenings, isn't it? Everything is everything has gone wrong. You just have to roll with the punches. Yeah. Or smash the whole system to pieces with a sledgehammer. You could do that as well. Let's have a look at the Novichok story. Uh, just briefly, I did say we'd have a look at it. Well, the BBC are reporting this evening that the couple in uh, Amesbury, Dawn Sturgis and her partner Charlie Rowley, apparently they had a, they were exposed to a very high dose of the nerve agent Novichok. Now, Dawn Sturgis died on Sunday evening, last evening, we were told. Not nice, of course, and it's reported that her partner, Rowley, Charlie Rowley, is critically ill in hospital and the BBC are reporting now that they had to have been exposed to a very high dosage of the agent. The Beeb says that police continue to hunt for a contaminated container which they believe was handled by the pair. Assistant Commissioner Neil Basu says the police will do everything to bring those responsible to justice. Do you want to hear Assistant Commissioner Neil Basu? Here he is. It is both shocking and utterly appalling that a British citizen has died having been exposed to a Novichok nerve agent. But make no mistake, we are determined to find out how Dawn and her partner Charlie, Charlie Rowley came into contact with such a deadly substance. And we will do everything we possibly can to bring those responsible to justice. The investigation is being led by detectives from the UK's counter-terrorism policing network and they are unable to say at this moment whether or not the nerve agent found in this incident is linked to the attack on Sergei and Yulia Skripal. However, this remains our main line of inquiry. Our focus and priority at this time is to identify and locate any container that we believe may be the source of the contamination. In the four months since the Skripals and Nick Bailey were poisoned, no other people besides Dawn and Charlie have presented with symptoms. But their reaction was so severe, it resulted in Dawn's death and Charlie being critically ill. This means they must have got a high dose, and our hypothesis is that they must have handled a container that we are now seeking. Detectives have already identified a red Ford Transit van that Charlie travelled in as a passenger on Saturday prior to falling ill and yesterday the military assisted us with transporting that from Amesbury to the Defence Science and Technology Laboratory at Porton Down. Three other men were also in the van that day and they've been identified and contacted by police. None of them are showing any signs of having been exposed to the nerve agent or feeling unwell and they are being screened as a precaution. Does anybody believe in this? This is Assistant Commissioner Neil Basu, that's what you just heard there saying that red vans, high dosage, high exposure. You have the Home Secretary, Sajid Javid, chairing the government's emergency committee, COBRA, and addressing MPs, saying that we'll do whatever we have to do to find out who's behind the poisoning. And while he was doing that, there was a number of politicians from right across the political spectrum taking to the airwaves to say that there can only be one explanation for it. 
It's got to be those damn Russians and the Kremlin. And the Kremlin just has to own up to it. And of course today, there was a meeting of the Balkan, 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 Balkan states in London, which was supposed to be chaired by the outgoing Foreign Secretary Boris Johnson. There are NATO meetings going on to talk about Syria and Russia. Wonderful timing that last week. Wonderful timing to say out of the blue that two people, not Russian, not connected to anybody, were exposed to Novichok and were fighting for their lives. Great timing that the World Cup in Russia, regardless of what you think about bread and circuses and all of that, it's been an absolute unmitigated success. Huge success. Massive red faces for the UK government who haven't sent anybody over there. The English team is doing well. They're in the semi-final. It's standard procedure at these tournaments that when England is playing, representatives of the country, sometimes the Royal Muppets, but other times political Muppets, will be there with the dignitaries of the host nation, but also the dignitaries of the opposition team. It's not happened. And yet English fans are sending back um, videos and they're posting Facebook posts saying what a wonderful country Russia is, how wonderful it has been, what wonderful hospitality, the food is great, the beer is great, the crack is great, the women are great, the men are great. It's just wonderful. You've got England fans actually going one step further and mocking their own government, saying, we were told to be very careful. You might remember me playing some audio from that fucking goon, John Sweeney, that fool who presents for Panorama for the BBC, that cretin, was on BBC Radio 5 several months ago, telling horror stories. I mean, horror stories about what had happened if fans went to Russia. Be careful over there, he was saying. Don't say anything. Don't speak about the government. All this crap. And you know, a lot of football fans, they believed it, dear listener. They believed it. They didn't go. I know a lot of football fans because I used to be a diehard football fan. I've spoken to them. I've got friends in Nottingham. I've got friends in Leeds. I've got friends in Aberdeen and Edinburgh who I've known over the years through football. And the London-based ones and the Nottingham-based ones particularly have followed England. Didn't go because they believed the bullshit. Asking them back in January, February, well, Terry, after the World Cup, Friend of mine, Nigel in Nottingham. Nigel, you must be going to the World Cup, surely. No, I'm not going, Richie. Why? Could be dangerous over there. Why, Nigel? Why is it dangerous over there? Ah, you know, with all the political stuff that's going on, war could break out. You might end up getting arrested. The Russians might take it out on the fans. This problem between Russia and England. The police might start beating the shit out of us. I said, you're joking, right? He said, no, no, I'm serious. I said, you're a clown. Go to the World Cup. You've saved up for it. Got your money. Go, mate. Go and enjoy it. See a bit of Russia. When England are not playing, get, when England are not playing, get on a train, mate. Go and see some of the countryside. No, they didn't go. So you had the scenario where there was like two and a half thousand fans. And whatever you think about English football fans, there's been a lot of problems over the years with a certain hooligan element. Of course there has. But along with the Irish... And along with the Brazilians, I would say, and a lot of the South American countries, their fans are the best travel in the world. They go everywhere. Not this time, but some of the fans are now sending stuff back, laughing at their own government. It was all nonsense. We're having the time of our lives here. It's great. Just a shame that Russia didn't beat Croatia, isn't it? In the quarterfinal the other evening, Saturday. Oh, we'd have had some laugh. <laughs> we'd have had some laugh this week, dear listener. We'd have had crack, all right. What a story that would have been. Christ, the media wouldn't have left that one alone, eh? Yeah. Rich Mortimer tweets, maybe Boris resigned because he gave all that bullshit about boycotting the World Cup. He certainly did. And if I dig hard enough into my media player here, I would find some audio of Johnson saying that the English team shouldn't even go to the World Cup. Madness. Check out RT. I know it's Russian state media. I know. 
but it is prevent, presenting the counter narrative to the Novichok bullshit. I mean, it, it, never has the British news media never before have they asked people to so suspend their disbelief to believe this shit. A known heroin addict collapses and God love him, I hope he's okay. His, his, his partner is dead and that's a terrible thing. There's nothing funny about it. I don't know the woman, of course. There's nothing funny. Let's hope the chap survives it. But you have to see it as a perfect bit of opportunism. Right in the middle of the World Cup as it's coming to a climax, this glorious, one of the best World Cups ever for entertaining football. Again, regardless of what your opinion is on bread and circus, it's wonderful. Great entertainment. Great stadiums, great cities. Even the BBC and ITV presenters are embarrassing the government. Talking about how great the Russian people are. Great stuff. We're being treated like royalty here. A friend of mine went to Russia back in the day. Mentioned him before on the programme. My mate Mike lives around the corner. Big friend. Great friend. Went to Russia. Travelled the country back when Russia was behind the Iron Curtain. When it was the Iron Curtain. Marvellous place, he said. Wonderful. Different mentality. People there. Doing stuff for one another. More open. None of this harsh, cold, austere people that were represented in the world's media and films. None of that. Just good people. Of course they are. Of course they are. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I keep getting tweeted these um, Alex clips from way back from Spirit Samba. Alex did some amazing work back in the day. And uh, I'll never knock it. Amazing work. What he's become now? Well, that's a tragedy. 20 minutes to the top of the hour. Enough of me for a minute. Let's have some music. Not Muzak, some music. All right, let me get rid of that. I just want to talk about something for a couple of minutes. This is really... It's, it's the sort of thing that I never get into. But I'm going to get into it just for a couple of minutes. Partly because it, it doesn't bother me what, what people say about the programme or the show. But I was sent a bit of audio today by a listener who thought I might find it interesting. And it was um, a video recorded by the former East 17 singer Brian Harvey, whom I had a very long conversation with about a year and a half ago, maybe a little bit longer, I can't remember, um, about possibly doing something. And subsequently, um, we didn't do anything. But um, Brian has made a, has made a video and he's alleging that um, I'm in cahoots with other independent content creators in the country to silence him and to prevent his story and what happened to him reaching a wider audience. Now, it's preposterous, but it's also kind of interesting. Preposterous what he's saying, but interesting in terms of um, what he's getting at. Um, I emailed him today to point out to him that uh, I don't work with anybody in this country. I particularly have nothing to do with certain independent news programmes produced a couple of hundred miles south of me here. Nothing to do with them. I wouldn't have anything to do with them in a million years. And certainly wouldn't work with anybody to suppress the information. It's also ironic that Brian Harvey is far better known in the UK than I am. Far better known. And outside of it probably as well. It's also kind of interesting that Brian's claims have been dealt with. Not entirely, of course, but have been mentioned in certain tabloid newspapers. Um, It's an interesting one. He's got a very interesting story to tell, Brian. And I'm sure that much of what he's claiming happened to him, did happen to him. When I spoke to him about coming on the programme, I liked him. I liked chatting to him. I thought he, he came across well in the conversation. We talked about what had happened to him and his story is not unfamiliar to me because I featured other people on this programme who've gone through MI6 stalking, harassment, phone hacking, um, lives being turned upside down by lies and all of that. I'm not immune to that. And I'm not unsympathetic to it. 
But I passed on Brian. And I mentioned this to Christine Hart last week. And Christine did an interview with Brian and put it on YouTube. And I passed on him only because Brian Harvey is saying things about people that he can't back up with solid facts. And, and as I said to him in an email I sent to him today, that's not me saying that I don't believe you or that I think you're wrong. It's me saying that it's all very well to make accusations against people which might be credible, but you have to have evidence to support it. He's linked people to the cover-up of paedophilia, that there is no evidence that these people are involved in covering up, not just paedophilia, but phone hacking. I can't touch that. And anybody with half a brain would understand why. It's the biggest danger that this programme faces, of course, is libel. Somebody to say, you libeled me, or you interviewed a guest who libeled me and you left them do it. The programme w- would cease to exist. It would go out of existence if I was sued for tens of thousands of pounds or hundreds of thousands of pounds. I certainly don't have tens of thousands of pounds and I certainly don't have hundreds of thousands of pounds. I wish I did. Not for the, the reasons of greed, but for the future of the programme. No, but you know what I'm saying. You, you, you just can't do it. But I thought it was ironic. Um, after I passed on bringing Brian on, but wished them all uh, the very best, what I thought was ironic was uh, several months later, Brian put a segment of my phone conversation with him on YouTube, meaning that without my knowledge or consent, Brian was recording a private conversation between me and him. And without getting my consent, A, to record it, uh, he put it on the internet. And I thought, how ironic. How ironic. And I didn't care, really, that he put the phone call on the internet. And I didn't really care that he recorded it. But it told me a lot about his character. Why would you record somebody? Why would you bitch and rant and rave about your privacy being invaded and your phones, phone calls being hacked and then you're recording people without telling them? It's a slimy thing to do, right? slimy thing to do and I thought to myself at the time you did right to pass on Brian Harvey now that doesn't mean I don't have any sympathy for him I think they chewed him up and spat him out and I think a lot of what Brian Harvey is saying is absolutely true but he's naming people to do with other things he's naming people on other stories he's naming people while talking about other issues And I can't have that on this programme. I can't have people being named when there isn't definitive proof that those people did what they are accused of. And that's not the same as me saying that that he's lying or I disagree with him. But it's just interesting. Um, I note that quite a few people have seen his video where he accuses this programme of working with others to silence them. It's just bullshit. And of course, anybody who knows this programme would know that's bullshit because many men and women have been on the programme to talk about what happened to them worse. What what happened to them, what happened to Brian happened to them and worse. So we're not scared of talking about this stuff. But there are certain people, Bill Maloney is another one, oh Richie, you've never had Bill Maloney on. No, nor will I ever have him on. And I said this three years ago, I said it two years ago, and I said it one year ago. And I was hammered for it. Oh, you're a bastard. What have you got against Bill Maloney? Nothing. Never met the guy. Nothing. And I'm sure he's got some interesting things to say. But he calls people paedophiles that haven't been arrested for paedophilia, that haven't even been suspected of paedophilia. So I can't have that. It's as simple as that. It's, it's common sense, ethical broadcasting. It's like you can't put somebody on the stand if you know they're going to lie in court. I can't knowingly put somebody on the air. I can't put somebody on the air knowing that they are going to make an accusation against somebody that hasn't been substantiated. So these are interesting times anyway. So, I mean, I wish Brian Harvey the best. I don't think he's in the best place. I think he was fucked over by... 
the intelligence agencies and the tabloids in this country. I have no doubt about it. None. But there are things being said about people that I could never allow be said on this programme unless there was definitive proof. Regardless of what I might think about those people and the veracity of those allegations, that's how it's got to work, you know. I think with programmes like this, I think there are... I don't believe that there's any deep state plot to bring down this particular programme. I'm not important. Never have been. Never will. There are other programmes. There are people making programmes. The, the opinions expressed are different, but at least they're 100% independent. There's good stuff out there. I don't think anybody cares specifically about this particular programme or is targeting it. However, there are agencies who would never miss an opportunity. And if you bring people onto a programme and you let them say things that are libelous, I think certain people would act. And that's why we can't do it. Kev tweets, listening to Sunday View, Richie, ever had, or maybe the question is, would you ever receive an invite to debate on the James O'Brien radio show? I'd like to hear that, says uh, Kev. No, Kev, they will never, ever, ever countenance the likes of me coming on there to talk to him about the European Union, about Zionism, um, about Rothschild Zionism, about cultural Marxism. They'd never tolerate that. I used to try back in the period when the People's Voice television ended and that period between that ending and me coming to Manchester to do this, basically. I used to try for the crack to get on to BBC Radio 5 Live and LBC. But it was uncanny. It was almost like they knew. Like I would use different mobiles and I would use a Skype phone where, with a Manchester number, I would use a landline that was ex-directory and I would ring up and I would say, I would lie basically, and I, I don't like lies. I try not to tell lies. Most of us try not to lie as we go through our lives. But I would tell them porkies. I would basically give them a story. They would be talking about Brexit or something and I they would have a phone in, Radio 5, Nicky Campbell, and I would ring up and a producer would answer and I would say, hi, this is, I would make up a name, you know, Mark Casey or this is uh, John Allen or whatever and, and this is my opinion. And I would give them some fairly moderate kind of lefty opinion about the European Union. And because I'm articulate, and because I was speaking, you know, I would speak to them very clearly, of course. I would say, this is my opinion. I'd like to get on there and say this to Nikki. But they never. Yeah, well, we've got your number. We'll, we'll call you back. Of course, I would never get called back. <laughs> that was it. Never get called back. So, no, they're not going to allow people like me on. It's like when, traditionally, over the years, when they've invited the likes of David Icke on. You know, he went on the politics show. No, he didn't. He went on This Week, the late night BBC show. You get seven minutes. What good is seven minutes? After they get asking the stupid questions about the Queen and lizards, there's not much time left to delve into why do you think this or why do you think that? Even if they were to allow somebody like me onto the James O'Brien show, it would be about five and a half minutes long. And you'd be interrupted so much that it wouldn't be worth your while. It's the way it works, the way it's always worked with the mainstream media. I used to be that guy. I don't know, I, I, in truth, I never was that guy. Even in my commercial radio days, I was never one for shouting at people or interrupting them incessantly. Never did that. Never belittled anybody. Never did it then, wouldn't do it now. But um, no, these avenues are closed off to the likes of us, I think. Right, that's it. Sorry for the rambling there. But um, needs must. You've got to improvise, adapt and overcome when a guest uh, pulls out suddenly at the last minute. I got an inkling just before the show that uh, she was going to pull out. I think it's because of something I said in another show. Could be that. I'll find out. And um, if it is, I will name her. <laughs> well, not, not maliciously, but I will say, well, this is who it was supposed to, uh, to be on Monday night. Now, now, listen up. Fragmented week, I said. My great friend, 
um, and truly great friend Jean Ann Crowley is in Manchester tomorrow and uh, I'm going to be spending a bit of time with Jean Ann. So there isn't a programme tomorrow night. Calm down, dear. Calm down. Going to do a show on Friday to make up for it as I always do. So there will be five shows again this week as there should be. So I'm away tomorrow night uh, with uh, Jean Ann um, carrying on with another woman. No. Uh, meeting my friend Jean Ann. She's in, in town tomorrow until Wednesday. Uh, now Wednesday is the, is, the, is the World Cup semi-final. So I'm going to do a live show in the afternoon. I'm going to do a live show with guests Wednesday afternoon because I won't have a live audience at 7 o'clock on Wednesday. Some 60% of the live audience anyway is based in the UK whereas only 30% of the podcast audience is in the UK, 60% of it is in America. That's the way it works. So on Wednesday, do a live show in the afternoon, 4 o'clock, but not in the evening. And then Thursday, we're back to normal with 7 o'clock show. Does that make sense, that? Do you understand that? I, I, probably not. But there you are. Away tomorrow, 4 o'clock live show Wednesday, and back to normal at 7 o'clock on Thursday. Hope that's okay. Thanks to David Vance for coming on in the first hour. If Brexit is driving you absolutely crazy, I'm sorry. It's important, and while it's important... I'm going to have to continue to cover it. Okay? And that's the way it goes. Going to leave you with some status quo to close out the programme. Uh, I'm going to get a bit of fresh air, stiflingly warm in the studio. And uh, we'll do it all again on Wednesday, live at 4pm UK time. 4pm UK time. I will tweet a lot about that so that you don't forget. The programme will, of course, then be repeated at 7pm UK time on Wednesday. Alrighty. Look after yourselves and one another. Thanks for listening to Monday's show.